right, so Maitri, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, so I work in the Department of Radiation Oncology. I'm a Canadian certified physician assistant. I graduated in 2014. Um, I started working the, there as part of uh, the HFO funding and I've been there since. Um, this is at Princess Margaret Hospital, the University Health Network. Um, I would say my role is primarily clinical, but there is a teaching and uh, research component to my role as well. So technically I work for the entire department, which is 39 physicians, um, and that could mean I work in all side groups. Um, over the last four years, I've ended up working in lung, breast, GU, gynae, GI, eye, CNS, uh, pediatric, endocrine, pituitary, and uh, repulsive clinic patients. Uh, but on, on a general in a general week, I would end up seeing mostly breast and GU patients. And is there any difference that patients can expect when seeing you or a physician or a fellow? Uh, in clinic, actually, there's not a lot of difference in whether they see myself, a fellow, a resident, or the staff physician, because um, in clinic, our practices are pretty similar. We're, for new patients, it's histories, physicals. Uh, communicating about the diagnosis, uh, obtaining consent for treatment, going through side effect profile, sort of into, uh, talking to them about anticipated future, timeline of how the treatment will go. The biggest difference comes from what happens behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, the radiation oncologists, including the residents and fellows, are involved in creating individualized, personalized plan for each and every patient um, because we're all anatomically different, our body sizes are different, how we're structured is very different. So we can't just use one plan for every breast patient, let's say. Um, it has to be extremely uh, carefully designed so we're not giving toxicity to the nearby organs. I don't have any training in that aspect, so I'm not involved in the radiation planning aspect, which is where the radiation oncologists can dedicate more of their time if I can help them clinically. And do you do the same thing every day of the week, or is there a little bit of variability? Usually my schedules tend to stay the same for about six months to eight months. My supervising physician and I will go through my schedule every six to eight months just to see if there are any particular clinics that need additional help. The beauty about having me versus um, an NP or a fellow is that I'm extremely flexible. Um, I, I, like I said, I work for all of the physicians, so I could be put into any clinic and I would get started. Fellows are, strictly speaking, uh, associated with one site and usually one or two physicians, so they're not, you can't just take a lung fellow and put them in a gynae clinic, even if gynae is overbooked or um, uh, behind in terms of their consoles. So, my week-to-week -week schedule looks to, looks the same, but over time, over the years, it does change. Um, so my job hours would be Monday to Friday, technically 9 to 5, but I'm almost always in uh, by 7.30, 7.45. I like to prep on my patients, get the day started. I like to read up on all my new patients so I know about their full history before I go in. Um, and then every, every clinic and every day is variable. I start off Monday morning with uh, a breast clinic. Uh, usually most of my clinics are clinics where we see some new patients and some surveillance patients. So our follow-up patients could be those who are just on either active surveillance or patients who are just following up without any imaging or blood work. Um, sometimes we follow up patients with mammogram and sometimes we see urgent uh, patients who are part of our follow-up schedule but they're coming in sooner than their appointment because they have any uh, either concerns that they're you know, symptoms they're feeling or questions they have about what they've gone through or what to anticipate and that sort of thing. Um, so Monday morning starts with breast clinic and then I go to gynae clinic in the afternoon where most of our cases are endometrial cancer and cervical cancer patients. We will see every now and then uh, palliative patients in that clinic. Uh, these are individuals who because of their gynecologic malignancies are bleeding actively so we do have to intervene sooner rather than later. Uh, we also, uh, will in clinic, we'll see review patients. So review patients are those who are undergoing radiation treatment right now. We need to keep a close eye on them because they could be experiencing side effects, anticipated side effects, but we need to be on top of things. Tuesday morning starts off with a GU clinic, a busy GU clinic, where I mostly see prostate patients. Uh, most of them are the ones who need post-operative radiotherapy, either in an adjuvant setting or a salvage setting. And then I end off Tuesday with uh, an eye clinic, which is ocular melanoma. Um, I've been doing that clinic consistently for the past four years because it was a new addition to the schedule when I joined the department. 
Wednesday, um, I would once again do prostate clinic and breast clinic in the afternoon. So like I said, prostate and breast tend to be my heaviest workload. I, Thursday morning, I have a head and neck and lung review, combined review. So this is where we see our, our head and neck and lung patients who are currently undergoing treatment. If we're overbooked or behind in terms of our CCO guidelines and when we have to see our new patients, we will see in one or two add-on new patients. Thursday afternoon, I have an endocrine clinic where we see mainly thyroid cancer patients. Um, and every now and then, we end up seeing urendocrine or pituitary cancer patients. Friday morning, up until recently, used to be my brain metastasis clinic where we saw, uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion, all of our um, cancer patients who have known brain meds. Either they need surgery, radiotherapy in one or the other form, or just surveillance because they're on immunotherapy. And then I have Friday afternoon uh, where I attend resident teaching, finish up on my charting. Um, if I have students at the time, I'll use that time to catch up with them, uh, do a maybe teaching session with them, and just dedicate a research time. So what difference has the service or department noticed since adding a PA and having that consistent face there for for years now. For, it's nice to be able to have one person who can pretty much cover any site group. Um, for example, the week of uh, Christmas, uh, a lot of the staff members are away and we could get urgent consults from anywhere or we could have patients who drop in. Um, and sometimes it's difficult if you can't find a covering physician or a covering resident. But if you have a PA who can go attend to any of the patients for any of the staff, it really makes the process a lot easier. Um, for example, on Remembrance Day weekend, on Monday, it was a stat holiday technically, so our clinics were canceled, but we did have a patient who I had never met before, but she had um, a really bad bleeding, fungating mass, and she needed attention sooner rather than later. She could have either gone to eMERGE and had to wait a lot, long time, but because I was able to attend to her and just update the physician about what my plan of action was um, and allow the physician to take over the care next day, it just makes the transition a lot smoother, both for the patients, for the physicians in charge, um, and I hope that it, you know, it's reducing the load that we have to put on our eMERGE departments and our inpatient beds. Excellent. And are those numbers that you're tracking um, or doing research into? Yes, so we did for the first year I was there collect a lot of uh, that data. We're uh, keeping track of uh, those numbers still, but what we really noticed was a reduction in two full-time staff physicians was uh, we were able to compensate for that reduction by hiring a PA because we, I was able to see the same number of new patients that a staff would see. For example, there is two um, radiation oncologists who treat endocrine malignancies, so both pituitary and uh, thyroid cancers. When I was introduced to the practice, I was seeing one third of the patients. I was contributing just as much as a staff physician in terms of the number of patient, new patients and follow-up patients I was seeing, which made it uh, financially feasible to keep me around as well as improve our access to care. One huge thing we noticed was uh, we only have one endocrine clinic per week, and like I said, there's only two physicians who are in charge of it, and we cover a pretty big uh, catchment area. So our wait times at one point were up to two to three months, and although thyroid cancer um, tends to be slow growing and it is safe to do so, uh, to wait that much, and pituitary tumors tend to be benign more often than not, when I was introduced, um, we were able to see a lot more consults, a lot more follow-up patients and organize their treatment. Um, our wait times are now down to about three weeks. So um, the multiple site groups have had that opportunity and that's why they'll put me in a site group where there's either a lack of a staff physician or there is uh, more consults than anticipated for that time frame. How did they introduce you or get you started in your job when you were first hired? They were uh, very cooperative in that they told me to think of myself as a, either a fourth year medical student or a first year resident um, and I was told to focus just mainly on histories and physicals um, and eventually as time went on I learned more and more. I started off by doing um, a course, it was uh, a cross-sectional anatomy because in PA school, there was not a lot of focus on reading CT scans, MRs, uh, PET scans, and radiation oncologists use, they read their own scans, uh, whether they're diagnostic or our own department scans, and use these to plan the actual radiation. So I had to become proficient in reading these scans, uh, which would also mean learning the anatomical landmarks um, as we see them on CTs, MRs, PET scans, etc. 
So they were very helpful in um, getting me to that stage where I was comfortable enough to uh, discuss the radiation plans with the patients, discuss the dose that we would, ex uh, we would uh, offer to the patients because sometimes it can defer and based on the patient their comorbidities will sometimes tailor our treatment plan. Um, and eventually we got to the point where I was able to put in the radiation prescriptions. Um, I am able to obtain consent uh, and get the process started without a supervising phys physician having to co-sign. How do the docs work with you uh, or how frequently are they seeing you? What's great about my department is I have constant access to all of my physicians. Uh, we're all on the same floor and most of them have an open door policy. I can just walk into their office and we can chat about whatever it is we need to, whether it's patient care or clinic concerns. Um, one supervising physician is the one who is in charge of my entire schedule, that's Dr. Richard Singh. And so we'll sit down every six to eight months and think about where I am mostly needed. I usually tend to go to clinics that are very busy or full. Over the years, we have known that sometimes when our radiation oncology, when our staff doctors leave, um, there is a gap that needs to be filled, so I'll end up covering those clinics. Um, for example, we had um, a radiation oncologist who moved out to BC, and he had a big clinic, he had a big prostate practice, so um, one of the other staff and I took over, and we were just helping cover that clinic for a while, so that would tend to be my role in how I interact with um, the physicians. Unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity to work with all 39 of them over the four years. That's a lot to go through, um, but I have worked with a lot of the senior staff. A lot of people, like you had said, liken uh, the PA role very similar to a resident or fellow, but what are some key differences in a physician's experience with a PA versus physician working with a resident or fellow? Um, with the physicians, anytime I'm starting off uh, a new clinic with a new physician that I haven't worked with before, I usually sit down with them and I ask them what their expectation of a PA is because most likely, um, as I'm the first PA in the department, they have not worked with a PA before. We do have some American staff who have had the opportunity to work with PAs in, their, um, Ameri in the American hospitals they worked at. So I like to know what their expectations of me are. Um, some phys most physicians, in fact, would expect me to do everything that they're doing, which is being able to see a patient, discuss treatment plan, um, obtain consent, walk them through the entire cancer journey that we would expect the patient to go through. Uh, but every now and then there are physicians who are either part of clinical trials quite a bit and I might not be aware of all of the clinical trials that they're part of or trying to recruit patients for. Um, so it tends to be a, a learning and a teaching opportunity for both myself and the physician. Once I get started with them and I'm in a routine, then we're sort of, we just, we, we know exactly what we're doing, which is I see all the new patients for the clinics that I'm part of. If there is a resident, because new patients are where most of the teaching is, then the residents will see the new patients um, and physicians will dedicate a little bit extra time with them to do the teaching. Um, for example, I've been going to the endocrine clinic also for the last four or so years um, and I can determine the dose that we would expect to give the patient for the radioactive iodine treatment, would go through the treatment plan, everything. But with the residents, um, it ends up being the first time that they're introduced to the concept of radioactive iodine treatments. So there's a little bit of a teaching component associated with the residents as opposed to me. Okay. And um, I suppose the residents uh, eventually, after completing whatever rotation, they go off onto another site. Yeah. So our radiation oncology residents are shared between Princess Margaret um, as well as Sunnybrook. And they do have some rotations they have to do uptown or in rural areas. So uh, they will rotate through different site groups. Um, and there are, we will go months sometimes without having a resident because they're doing their rotations at Sunnybrook, let's say. Or what can staff expect when they're interacting with you, specifically nurses, um, support staff, etc.? So with the nurses, um, they know that they have somebody to go to if the radons are not available. Um, they can expect the same kind of response from me as they can from a radiation oncologist, which is either following up on patients' results, um, following up on... Um, I, would, I would have said yes up until about a month ago, and uh, since then, uh, I believe a PA has been hired in the London Health Sciences. Um, one of our staff uh, and an individual I closely worked with for about 
about a year and a half, became the chief of London Regional Cancer Center. Um, he's extremely pro PAs, um, and he's in fact come to some of our uh, Queen's Park Lobby Day events as well, because uh, he's been very enthusiastic about involving, um, or not involving, I should say, rather uh, creating a multidisciplinary um, approach to cancer care, which includes uh, PAs, nurse practitioners, CSRTs, which are clinical specialty, uh, specialist radiation therapists. Um, so as part of his bigger plan for London Regional Cancer Center, he did the HFO application this year and he was approved to hire a PA. It sounds like the PA model really works in radiation oncology. It'd be great to introduce them in rad onc uh, departments across the country. So if there is a chief of staff or a hospital that's thinking about adding a PA to radiation oncology, what are some of the steps they should go through or things they want to think about before uh, adding a PA? Uh, one thing that we did and I would urge others to do is to look at what their numbers are because numbers do talk a lot. Um, we basically uh, were able to show with our first study that introducing a PA to an academic center, which is very busy as is, not just from a clinical point of view, but also from a research point of view, if you can hire a PA or two in that setting, they can um, help significantly in a clinical aspect and the quality of care that the patients receive is identical to what the residents, fellows, or staff would provide. And a lot more time can be freed up for research, teaching, um, and other activities that the Red Onks um, want to participate in. So if there are busy academic centers, or busy non-academic centers as well, um, if they have the numbers to show that an addition of a PA will help them see extra new consults per year, um, or help them uh, help them cut down their wait times, I think that's the first thing to look at. And I know that funding is a big concern. Um, I remember you did a talk at Kappa, four years, four different yeah. methods of funding. So can you sort of walk us through what that looked like year by year for you? So the first year I started off, like I said, I was part of the HFO funding. The plan was HFO was going to provide 50% of my salary, 25% of it was going to come from my department, which is uh, all of the physicians, um, they have a pot. Uh, that's how I like to think of it. And the pot pays for their salaries, and that pot would have paid 25% of my salary. And 25% was coming from UHN. Um, starting second year, the plan was 25%, uh, 50 percent of my salary was going to come from the department and 50% from UHN. But we had a change in our administration, um, and as part of budgeting, they had they removed all of PA funding. So what that meant was um, my department's goal to hire two PAs had to be put on hold because now they had to use the same money to pay one PA, which is what they did for the second year. Um, and then in the interim, we were able to uh, do our application for the Ontario Oncology Association. So Ontario Oncology Association um, helps different radiation oncology or other oncology departments hire um, additional staff in form of either uh, GPOs, which are uh, GPs in oncology training, or uh, clinical specialists or internists um, who can help with the oncology workload. So we used that process to apply for my position, which is a PS position, and it was approved. Um, and now we've finally gone on to me being a permanent part of the department, and I am being funded through the pot, as we call it, the PMA, the partnership, um, which is where all of the radiation oncologists put their billing and they all have set salary and I'm paid through the same salary because I technically indirectly uh, help the pot, but I don't obviously do any of my own billings. Uh, how the patient is doing clinically? So we do have, for example, um, a triage line for every site group and this is manned by the nurses. So they do try to cover almost all of the calls as much as they can, but every now and then there is a call that comes through which has to be directed to the staff. In the past, uh, the nurses would have to try to find the staff if they're on leave or if they're at a conference, they would have to try to find a covering rat onk. What's been really good is the nurses know I work in all these different side groups and the triage nurses know to turn to me um, if there are any concerns that crop up and it can be sorted a lot quicker and easier than them having to hunt down the staff and at the end of the day get the same answer. Um, so the, the support staff in form of nursing, uh, social workers, our, admins, uh, our admin support in the offices, uh, they can all expect the same kind of response and uh, workload from me as they would from the staff physicians. Um, and our interactions tend to be quite similar, whether it's a facilitation of a referral to another hospital, 
triaging incoming referral. Yeah. Do you work with medical directives? I do, uh, yes. So UHN has a set of uh, base medical directives, which uh, thankfully does cover a lot. Um, so in my, in my own uh, department, we had to add the directives for me being able to put uh, radiation prescription, which obviously is a significant uh, deal because if you put in the wrong prescription, it can be lethal for the patient. And uh, thankfully, we do have multiple, um, uh, multiple checkpoints where things get... Uh, um, assessed and reassessed before the dose is actually delivered to the patient, but this was a pretty important uh, medical directive for me to get. Um, so after six months of me working there, I had an assessment with all of the physicians I was working with at the time. They individually observed me uh, with multiple patients to everything from uh, new patient interaction, histories, physicals, uh, yeah, obtaining consent, talking about side effects, uh, seeing patients who are on treatments, review patients, putting in radiation prescriptions, putting in the radiation doses, the diagnosis in our, uh, in our radiation system. And once all of that was approved with all of the physicians I worked with at the time, those medical directives went in. Excellent.